Despite an initial successful string of victories in the Korean War, the 65th Infantry Regiment of the U.S. Army, conformed mostly of native Puerto Ricans, suffered catastrophic casualties during the Battle of Outpost Kelly in September of 1952. Less than a month later, the Borinquaneers faced an even more challenging undertaking, and even after two weeks of intensive retraining, they would suffer a far greater calamity during the battle for Jackson Heights. However, sick of the unfair treatment by their superiors, the Boricua soldiers would not hold on to the last man, and their decision would cost them everything. The Boricuaneers. The 65th Infantry Regiment, a Puerto Rican regiment of the U.S. Army, was established in March of 1899 as the first body of native troops in Puerto Rico. Nicknamed the Boricuaneers for the original Taino Indian name for Puerto Rico, the regiment's motto was Honor et Fidelias, or Honor and Fidelity. The infantry regiment went on to participate in World War I, World War II, the Korean War, and most recently in the global war on terrorism. In the 1950s, the men of the 65th, attached to the U.S. Army's 3rd Infantry Division, were amongst the first American troops to meet the enemy on the vicious battlefields of Korea. Born in a tropical climate, the Boricuaneers suffered significantly from the cold weather. But despite their lack of warm clothing, the 65th Infantry men fought through it all and achieved great success in the early stages of the war. Then, in mid-September of 1952, the 65th Infantry Regiment engaged in the Battle of Outpost Kelly, where the United Nations Command and Chinese forces fought for the possession of a UN outpost position. During the engagement, the Chinese successfully seized the position and defended it against UN counterattacks, resulting in 500 casualties from the infantry regiment. Because of the failure to hold and recapture the UN outpost, the soldiers were pulled off from the front line and sent to an intensive training program led by the 3rd Division commander. Additionally, Colonel Juan Cesar Cordero, the Puerto Rican regimental commander, was relieved of command and replaced by Colonel Chester de Gavre, the Continental Commander. Changes In a meeting held at the Regimental Command Post to welcome Colonel Chester de Gavre, other top battalion commanders and regimental staff discussed the options to improve the regiment's lacking performance during the Battle of Outpost Kelly. Many of the officers blamed the Puerto Rican soldiers and the previous commander, with one regimental executive officer even suggesting that the men should shave off their mustaches until they proved to be real men. Still, General Douglas MacArthur, commander of the United States-led United Nations forces in the early stages of the Korean War, recognized their, quote, magnificent ability and courage in field operations. They are a credit to Puerto Rico, and I am proud to have them in my command. Carlos Patances, commander of the 2nd Battalion and the senior Puerto Rican officer remaining in the regiment, was quickly disgusted by the dishonorable behavior of the regiment officer's comments, later calling it the dirtiest disloyalty he'd ever seen in his life. Despite a visit from three battalion chaplains to try to explain to Colonel de Gavre the cultural significance and even the religious importance of the Puerto Rican soldiers to keep their mustaches, the advice was ignored. The men from the 65th Infantry were all ordered to shave off what they believed was a symbol of masculinity and maturity, but many refused, and a rebellious streak spread throughout the unit. De Gavre then gave the soldiers one week to comply with the order or face charges of a court-martial, and many of the Boricuaneers waited until the last minute. Several other orders from the top officers added to a general dissatisfaction within the regiment, including a sudden change of rations from their native food to solely American food, and in order to remove the word Boricuaneers from the regimental vehicles. To them, it looked like the new regimental commander actively disliked the Puerto Ricans. Meanwhile, Despite the intensive two-week training, the regiment still lacked experience, particularly the non-commissioned officers at the infantry platoon level. Furthermore, the unit was suddenly ordered back into the battlefield, and on the night of October 24th, the Boricuaneers moved into a new position on the east side of the Chowan Valley, with its right flank resting south of Hill 391, soon to be called Jackson Heights. The regiment was taking the place of the Republic of Korea's 51st Infantry, which had been fighting the Chinese People's Volunteer Army in the area since early October, with the position now in danger of collapse. A Brutal Encounter On the night of October 24th, the 65th's G Company, led by Captain George Jackson, took over the defense of the high ground immediately south of Jackson Heights. 
While the Hill had enough bunkers to house three rifle platoon command posts, company headquarters, and even a forward artillery observer, none of the men were prepared to fight off such an attack. Facing G Company were elements of the People's Volunteer Army's 3rd Battalion, commanded by Hui Yanghua and protected by the 25th Artillery, which soon began firing against the Puerto Ricans' positions from 2,800 yards northwest in Camelback Hill. By dusk, G Company had been subjected to over 250 rounds of mortar and artillery fire, and PVA nighttime patrols continued attacking them throughout the night. During the next few days, Captain Jackson and his men attempted to break up the Chinese probes and the advancing soldiers. However, the Chinese persisted, and one of their rounds hit the company's mortar ammunition supply, blowing up close to 150 rounds and taking dozens of lives. By nightfall on the 27th, the enemy had reduced the mortar platoon to only two mortars and seven men, while the second platoon suffered significant casualties, including the leader and sergeant. Consequently, Captain Jackson reported to the 2nd Battalion and asked for aid for his wounded men, also requesting smoke around the heights to obstruct the PVA's view. Not long after, a PVA artillery concentration hit the G Company's positions, leading Jackson and his men to defend themselves by using whatever remaining mortars and weapons they had. The second PVA assault of the evening was even more massive, firing an estimated 1,000 rounds upon Jackson Heights in less than an hour and hitting the ammunition dump once again. By then, the company's communications sergeant reported that only three men were left in his position and asked the 2nd Battalion for permission to withdraw. While it is unclear whether the sergeant acted on his own, Batances assumed the request was coming from the company commander and ordered the withdrawal of the G Company. Jackson tried to verify the withdrawal order, but the communications lines were out, as were the radios, and he then ordered his platoon leaders to withdraw. Retaking Jackson Heights When Colonel de Gavre found out about G Company's withdrawal, he immediately ordered the A Company, led by First Lieutenant John Porterfield, be placed under the operational control of Batances for a counterattack to regain the hill. F Company, commanded by Captain Willis Cronkite, would also take part in the attack and man the outpost, while the men from C Company would prepare to back up A Company if necessary. As the sun rose on October 28th, Captain Cronkite led F Company towards Jackson Heights, and while they encountered a PVA platoon defending the hill, the company quickly took over the crest. Meanwhile, Porterfield and his A Company were also slowed down by enemy artillery fire, but they pushed through and soon joined F Company on the hill. Still, the remaining platoon was pinned down by mortar fire at the base of Jackson Heights Hill. And just when the men thought that the operation was going their way, a direct hit landed in the middle of A Company's command post and took the lives of Lieutenant Porterfield, a platoon leader, and the forward observer, while severely wounding the one remaining platoon leader. After the demoralizing attack, the men from A and F Companies began to retreat from the area and went back to the line. By the evening, only some of Captain Cronkite's F Company officers remained on the hill. Orders from the 2nd Battalion to return to the hill were vehemently ignored. Consequently, Captain Betances ordered Cronkite and his officers to withdraw from Jackson Heights by nightfall. The following day, the 65th Regiment attempted to take the hill once again by sending C Company, led by 1st Battalion Commander Major Davies. The men moved up the hill and took possession without enemy resistance, but fear soon took over and they left en masse. Once again, the stragglers were ordered back up the hill, but over 50 of them refused forcing Davis to recall the command group back to the line. Jackson Heights was now deserted, and according to the Puerto Ricans, rightfully so. Aftermath Colonel de Gavra was irate about G Company's withdrawal from Jackson Heights, as he expected his men would hold the outpost no matter the cost. After the battle, the U.S. Army implemented several policy changes, including one which only allowed the division commander to authorize a retreat. Following the disastrous confrontation, 95 soldiers from the 65th Regiment were taken to trial for desertion by General Court Martial in what became the largest mass trial of the war. 91 soldiers were found guilty and taken to prison terms, with sentences ranging from 12 months to 18 years of hard labor. However, following a public outcry and the intervention of the Puerto Rican government years later, Almost a hundred convicted soldiers were granted clemency and pardons. Captain Cronkite was eventually awarded the Silver Star for his heroism in the Battle of Jackson Heights, while First Lieutenant Porterfield was posthumously promoted to captain and received the Bronze Star Award. Meanwhile, 
Lieutenant Commander Carlos Patances was relieved from his command. Then, in November of that same year, the 65th Regiment returned to an intensive training program. Major General George Smythe, the division commander, requested that a more experienced combat trained regiment be assigned either permanently or long term while the Puerto Ricans completed their program. If neither alternative was possible, Smythe favored the reconstruction of the regiment with at least 60% mainland United States personnel while assigning the excess Puerto Ricans to other units. As such, by March of 1953, the Boricuaneers ceased being the Puerto Rican Regiment. With its Puerto Rican soldiers reintegrated to other units, the 65th then became an infantry regiment like all the others in Korea, and the percentage of Puerto Rican personnel dropped to a mere 5%. Still, redemption for the 61,000 Puerto Ricans that bravely fought during the Korean War has only grown throughout the years. As Professor of Communications at the University of Puerto Rico, Silvia Alvarez Corbello put it, quote, The Puerto Rican soldier performance was also an affair of dignity, a mixture of pride, bravery, self-respect, and patriotism. Thank you for watching my Dark Docs video. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and for more exciting military and historical content, don't forget to hit the bell icon and subscribe to all the Dark Documentaries channels. Stay tuned.